Hello, everyone, and welcome to this presentation, Pawn the Next Generation. I'm Christopher Brett Rennes. This presentation was originally uh, developed for the good people at Top Bloke, a charity that focuses on young men's mental health. But like many things in 2020 and 2021, COVID went and threw a spanner in the works. So today, I will be talking about the impacts of porn on young people. And I'm going to talk about more porn misuse than porn addiction, but as you'll see, we will cover it a little bit later. First, I'd like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet today. I would like to acknowledge the elders past, present and emerging. So today I'm going to cover a quick look at um, porn um, through the ages, why someone might use porn, the brain in porn, porn addiction, what I see in clinical practice, and if you're a parent of a young person who you think might be uh, misusing porn, some suggestions of what you can do. So porn and erotica aren't new. I'm, I love the arts. I was a designer in my 20s before I went into mental health. And the one thing that I've noticed, and any of you might notice on a leisurely stroll around an art gallery, is that there is a fair bit of nudity. So let's have a quick look at some. This rather curvaceous little statue is considered the world's oldest example of erotic art dating from 35,000 to 40,000 BCE. And this amazing temple depicts in detail the Kama Sutra, which most people have heard of, but have very little knowledge of what it actually is. The Kama Sutra is an ancient Indian Hindu text on sexuality, eroticism, and emotional fulfillment in life. And this amazing artwork dates from 885 CE. In 1748, England's first porno is printed. I'm surprised it actually took them this long. Fanny Hill, which was published in 1748, was banned in the UK till 1970. I had a look and a read at what I could find of it online, and it is very tame to what's around today, even in the mainstream media. However, what people perceive as porn is interesting. When I was a designer, I worked in publishing for a non-pornographic lesbian lifestyle magazine called Lottle, and we did an issue to raise awareness of breast cancer, which had beautiful black and white portraits of women who had either a single or a double mastectomy. It was a brilliant addition, and to this day, it's one of my proudest works. However, the magazine got banned in the US for being what they considered pornographic. In 1978, a blockbuster was created, Debbie Does Dallas. At the time, it was considered a major success for selling 50,000 units which when you think about it under the current environment, 50,000 isn't a huge amount. So what changed? The internet changed everything. To put it into perspective, the top four porn videos on Pornhub have a combined number of views of 709 million. Once upon a time, Young guys had to hope that their dads or older brothers had a stash of porn and that they had to wait till they were 18 to go and buy porn from an adult store. I don't know how many of you did this. I did. And I can remember being as nervous as hell and thinking, crap, what if somebody sees me as I come out of the shop? Now you can watch porn 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and you don't even have to switch on your computer. You can just switch on your phone. Access and convenience is what has changed. And with it has also come issues around regulating who can and who cannot engage in it. It cannot be underestimated the impact that early exposure 
to age inappropriate sexual content can have on a child. In some cases, it can be traumatic and impact both psychological concept of sex as well as their age appropriate behavior. The AU Kids Online Study of Children and Young People aged 9 to 16 years reported that 44% of participants have encountered sexual images in the past 12 months, whether online or offline, while 28% of 11 to 16-year-olds have seen sexual images online. The study also showed that among 11 to 16-year-olds who had seen online sexual content, 24% had seen online sexual images, including nudity. 17% had, someone, had seen someone's genitals online. 16% had seen images of someone having sex. And 6% had seen violent sexual images. However, an investigation by Michael Castleman looking at the analytical data of the world's largest web-based porn site, Pornhub, found that more than half of viewers spent less than five minutes per visit. And 86%, almost nine out of 10 visitors, spent less than 20 minutes. Only two viewers per thousand watched more than two hours at a time. So what is the problem with porn? When we think of porn, a lot comes to our minds and a lot is negative. However, I want you just to pause for a moment and think of porn a lot like alcohol. Both porn and alcohol have the potential to be harmful, but for most people, occasional use isn't a cause of concern. Like, just like alcohol, porn can be used as a coping mechanism or lead to addiction. And just like alcohol, pornography use can also contribute to problems with sexual function, including erectile problems and delayed ejaculation. It is important to understand why someone uses porn. Is it because they're horny? Teens are hormones on legs, and are they just using it as a release? Is it because they are bored? This is a bit problematic, engaging in porn to pass the time. And if you look at the recent lockdowns, there has been a lot of time that people were bored. Is your young person using it as a way of coping with stress, anxiety, depression? A lot of young guys that I see in their early 20s say that they developed their porn misuse when they were in their teens, particularly around HSC. Think about the way we teach kids from year seven up, that the final exam is going to set the course for the rest of their life. If they fail, there is no hope. And that is rubbish. But young people take that message into heart. And so they are stressed. They are anxious. Anxious as well about the unknown that's to come after high school. Porn is a convenient release, particularly as most students do study on their laptops which can be problematic. Are they using porn as a way of exploring aspects of their sexuality? And I will come back to this in a moment. And finally, are they using it as a form of self-education? Sex education in schools at this moment in time is not about pleasure. It's about prevention, prevention of pregnancy, prevention of infection. Only in the last few years have we started teaching young people about consent. So where do young inquisitive minds go to learn how to have sex? The internet. Research has shown that there is a correlation between poor mental health and the frequency of porn use. 20% of daily pornography users had depressive symptoms, significantly more than infrequent users. Frequency of pornography use has also been associated with negative effect, depression, and stress among young men. This again brings us back to the, the why question. Why are they using it? They are using it as a way to cope with pain that they are experiencing. 
Earlier, I spoke about kids using porn as a way of self-education and exploration. And this is very true for queer kids. For queer kids, getting education around sex can be difficult. And so they turn to the internet. But what's on the internet is not always good or safe. For example, anal douching is a process many gay men and women do to clean out the bowel before sex. It is best done with just plain room temperature water. I had a client a few years ago who didn't know that. And so they went online and read a post that said that they should douche with Dettol. I can tell you it didn't go well. At the same, and the same is for sex. We know from research that there is an increased pornography viewing among LGBTIQ plus young people. And that is primarily due to the lack of information in mainstream culture around non-heteronormative sexual behaviors, resulting in the need to access this information via pornography. Same-sex attracted adolescent boys reported using pornography to learn about the sexual organs and functions the mechanics of same gendered sex. And for the record, it's not as straightforward as you think. They also used it to learn about sexual performance and roles and to understand how sex should feel in terms of pleasure and pain, which often I have to remind my clients, both straight or gay, that it is a performance. It's a fantasy. When I work with clients, before I ask them the why question, there are three questions I ask in relation to porn. Do you watch porn? Most guys say yes. How often do you watch porn? Frequency does increase the chances of misuse, addiction, and impact on sexual function. But the next question is the important one. How long do you use porn. The client might say they only watch porn once a week, and you might think, oh, that's not much. However, that one session might be a 13-hour long edging session where they are doing a lot of screen hopping from porno to porno and trying to make and sustain that wonderful feeling that they are getting from that dopamine release. So at this point, it might be worthwhile looking at what porn addiction actually looks like. Porn addiction involves many aspects that you will see in other addictions. So let's just go through some of the main ones here. Excessive viewing of pornography. I've had clients where we worked out that they would watch hours of porn per day, not necessarily in one go. They would watch it while at work. They would go to the bathroom at work. They would watch it first thing in the morning. One client even called it his heart starter. The porn addiction interferes in normal daily behavior and responsibilities. For example, staying up all night watching porn, even though they know that they are not going to get any sleep. This impacts on study and work. Having to go off and masturbate in the toilet to, to porn when they've got guests over, calling in sick to just spend the day wanking. Most of the time spent watching pornography or searching for more stimulating types of pornography is needed to get the person more aroused or to climax. There is a sense of emotional distress and feelings of withdrawal when the porn use is stopped. Continued pornography use, despite serious consequences like losing a job or end of a relationship, compulsive masturbation, sexual dysfunction, which I will cover a little bit later, and negative effects on relationships. But it is important to remember that addiction is a coping mechanism. Paula Hall, who has written some amazing books on sex and porn addiction, wrote, addiction is a way of managing life. It is a strategy used to alleviate negative emotions and create positive ones. Some people refer to addiction as an anesthetizing behavior, a way of numbing out the world. Others refer to addiction as hedonistic behavior, 
a way of seeking perpetual pleasure. Often it is both, or at least that's how it starts. But over time, the drug of choice, be that porn or cocaine or alcohol or food, creates the very problems we're trying to escape and provides very limited pleasure indeed. At this point, it might be helpful to talk about the very, in very basic terms, the mechanics of what's going on in our heads when we watch porn. We are dealing with a biological system that has evolved over millions of years to reward us engaging in sex. Just like eating, our brains are hardwired to enjoy these activities, which can also be the problem when we are working with clients with sex and porn addiction. Sex and porn consumption has very little to do with downstairs. It's all about our brains. Our brains taking information, be it the images that we see or the pleasurable sensations from touching our genitals. The brain takes it in, processes, and releases the neurotransmitters that lead us to experiencing enjoyment from it. The brain also plays an important role in human sexual response by mediating our thoughts, our emotions, our memories of these thoughts and emotions, as well as past sexual experiences. For example, if you have a traumatic sexual experience, your brain may see sex as a dangerous activity and you may get anxious, flashbacks, or even disassociate. Our brains also plays an important role in sexual fantasies. Certain neurotransmitters such as dopamine influence sexual arousal and response. Neurons that release dopamine are activated when we both anticipate as well as receive a reward. So, we just have to think about doing the act or have a fantasy. In this case, watching porn, we start to experience some of those good feelings that we get from dopamine. Dopamine doesn't just make it feel good and pleasurable. It also enhances reward-related memories so that we have good thoughts when we think of it and we want to go back for more. So this is why it is important to understand why someone uses porn. If they are watching porn every now and then, problems aren't likely to occur. But if the person is stressed, for example, and they are starting to use it as a release, soon that they're going to get to the point where that person is watching porn like they would YouTube. There's no arousal. Sometimes there might not even be an erection. There might not be masturbation, just engagement. So what can happen if you watch too much porn? Well, you can develop something called porn-induced sexual dysfunction. And what do I see in clinical practice in relation to porn misuse and addiction? I mentioned before on excessive viewing of porn, and this is a quote from one of my clients. I jerk off most mornings about 15 to 20 times. I've had other clients who weren't able to come straight from their home to the appointment without stopping off and either masturbating or having sex. It becomes a need, it becomes a craving like any other substance or drug. Have you ever been to the gym and seen the body beautiful guys in their shoestring tank tops and the perfect bods lifting unhuman amounts of weight and thought, crap, I'm never going to look like that. The same thing happens for young guys when they watch porn. They experience feelings of inadequacy compared to the actors in pornographic movies. They think their dicks aren't big enough, they don't come enough, they don't have the stanima, and they don't have the bods like the actors have. This can lead to anxiety when they have real life sex, sexual experiences. And remember, anxiety is about the future. 
That's the what ifs and the shoulds. So what's happening for these young guys when they're with their partners is that they aren't in the moment. They're up in their heads worrying. Will I get hard? Will I last? Will I make them orgasm? Am I doing it right? We have to remember that a lot of porn is highly scripted, edited, airbrushed, and at times just unrealistic. From conversations I've had with porn actors over the years, it's not as glamorous as the end product looks. For a 15 minute clip, it can take a couple of hours of filming. So just think about the amount of editing that is, it's taken to make the final product. Edging is the deliberate drawing out of the time between orgasm to relish stimulation and sustain the release of dopamine. What also happens is that they do a thing I call screen hopping. They have multiple tabs open. They jump from one video to another video, never really watching one. So the novel stimuli keeps changing, which doesn't happen when they are with their real life sex partners. Edging can result in delayed ejaculation, which leads to the guy feeling frustrated, but it can also lead to complex feelings for their partners from feeling frustrated, as well as feeling rejected, unattractive, and unloved. Earlier, I mentioned clients or people with um, porn misuse needing more, and this is called the Coolridge effect. Often, when men watch porn, they don't just don't watch one porn video. They might jump from one movie to another and not focus on that video on the screen because they're thinking about finding a better one. What also happens is that the viewer gets desensitized to what they have been watching. So to get the same level of rush, they need to watch something that is a little bit more extreme. This builds up over time. Now, there is nothing wrong with king sex, but what happens with, here with the Coolidge effect is that it's not just about porn viewing. It translates to the real world sex. So vanilla sex that they are having with their partner may not be stimulating enough. This can lead to erectile dysfunction, for example. Now, I want to stress that this is not about attraction or love, but the level of stimulation needed to become aroused and reach orgasm. Over the years, working with clients, I've discovered that there are hundreds of ways of mas to masturbate. It's completely mind boggling. The problem is that some have a masturbation style that doesn't simulate a real world experience when they're having sex with their partner. And we call this idiosyncratic masturbation styles. And I will give you an example. A few weeks ago, a client in his early thirties saw me for an issue around not being able to ejaculate. After talking for a bit, we got around to masturbation and he described the way that he masturbates. So I want you to picture this. I want you to imagine somebody sitting in a chair upright with one leg up and bent and with their arm put through the legs to masturbate. Right away, you can see how this is not like sex. But the way a guy masturbates doesn't have to be as elaborate as this example to have an impact on sexual function. And this leads me to my last point death grip. If a man watches hours of porn and masturbates frequently, his penis can become less sensitive. And as a result, it takes longer to come and can get more and more frustrating. So as a result, what a lot of guys do, and they don't even know it, is that they start to grip their penis harder to achieve sufficient stimulation. This is a contradictory effect as it re further reduces sensitivity, making it gradually even more difficult to reach orgasm, both 
by themselves and with their partners. However, do not fear. All that, that those things I've just mentioned are treatable. With both behavioral exercises as well as cognitive treatments, all those conditions that I mentioned can be treated and managed. And if your son does watch porn, remember, it's not the end of the world. Your reaction could impact not only their relationship with porn, but with sex generally. There is nothing shameful about sexual exploration. So what can you do as a parent of a young person? It's about leading by example. I'm now gonna ask you to think about your relationship with your current partner. Is your relationship healthy? Do you respect each other and their, in your, the, your partner's individuality? Is your relationship open and honest? Do you support each other's choices? Do you have equal say and do you respect each other's boundaries? Are you able to hang out with your friends and family without your partner getting jealous? Can you communicate without fear of negative consequences? Do you feel safe to be open and honest? And is your relationship free of guilt and jealousy? That is what a healthy relationship can look like. It is important to point out that the absence of violence doesn't mean that a relationship is healthy or not abusive. An abusive relationship can involve many different aspects, including verbal abuse, which includes swearing at your partner, humiliate them at the dinner table, or when you're with friends and family. It might involve attacking them about their intelligence or how they look. An abusive relationship can involve psychological abuse, the most well-known being the use of fear and threats. There can also be emotional abuse, blaming, comparing them to others to damage their self-worth, using silence as well as emotional blackmail. Emotional uh, uh, relationships can also be abusive by using isolation, restricting them from using their phone, computer, restricting them from seeing friends and family. One aspect of an abusive relationship that is not often thought about as abusive is financial abuse, meaning that the perpetrator controls the money, in particular, the spending, often meaning that if the victim is to escape, they leave with nothing. When we think of sexual abuse, we think of graphic rape scenes, but it can be a lot more subtle than that. It can involve coercion into doing unwanted sexual things. It can also involve the distribution of explicit photos without consent. And it can be involve forced sex without contraception. The point here is that children are sponges and they take in all the information that is in their environment. This includes interpersonal and relationship information. And your behavior informs them how to have a healthy relationship. However, it is also important to keep in mind that the environment that you create with your partner may be the very thing that is pushing your child to watch porn as a means of escape. Before speaking with your young people about sex, porn, sexual health, or sexuality, it is important to be familiar with your own beliefs and values. We need to ensure young people that they do not feel judged, that they can safely engage in a discussion about their own sex uh, values related to sex, porn, sexuality, and sexual health, and 
They are not excluded from the conversations because of their sexual experiences or behavior. Talking to your child about porn means talking about other sexual things as well. Sex is more than just biological reproduction. It's about good and respectful relationships, sexual feelings, sexual pleasure, personal values and beliefs around sexual relationships. It's about gender roles, how to have safer sex, contrac contraception, including emergency contraception. It also involves the ways to be intimate without sexual intercourse. It involves around talking about sexual problems, sexual orientation, and how to say no to unwanted sex and what to do if it happens. It also involves talking about to your sons as well about what happens if their partner gets pregnant. This may all seem rather overwhelming. So what can you do? The thing to keep in mind is prohibition doesn't work. History teaches us this. So it is about understanding that your sons and your daughters are probably looking at porn. With a harm minimization approach, it is about creating an environment where the least amount of harm is done. So for you, that's about creating an environment where talking about sex isn't a taboo. It's about having conversations about sex in the media and representation. When was the last time you discussed with your kids the representation of women in media? How come old men get to be newsreaders, but female newsreaders get let go once they reach a certain age? It's about building relationships with your sons so that when shit goes wrong, that they come, can come to you for help rather than feeling shame or that they will be punished. If you don't have a relationship with your sons, don't be surprised when they don't come to you for help. Your sons need love and support. It won't make them wimps, quite the opposite. It will help them develop positive coping skills. It will give them a positive mental blueprint of how to be a good partner and parent. I want to finish tonight with a lovely story of a young client I've been working with. At 18, he made the poor decision, like many young guys are doing these days, to use steroids. Well, he gained the body mass he wanted, but he also experienced the very common side effects of using steroids, which is erectile dysfunction. Steroids are illegal. However, the client's relationship with his parents was one where they had a good relationship and more importantly, good communication with each other. So when the client started having problems, he felt he could turn to his parents for help without fear of shame or judgment. Yes, he did something stupid. Even his mother said that. But the love for their son is, was immense. They went to the appointments with him, so he wasn't by himself. He was able to talk to them about treatments going forward. And more importantly, he wasn't suffering in silence by himself, which for many compounds the problem. He's now doing well and is, in, is recovering really well. Thank you very much. And again, I would like to thank Top Bloke for the opportunity to put this together.